The Black Woman's Guide to Understanding the Black Man. Forward. While the scabs on the wounds inflicted by the Black Man's Guide to Understanding the Black Woman are barely healed, we now embark on the second phase of this purification process to expose and dissolve selective behaviors that destroy love and stifle respect between Blacks. Of course, it is impossible to include in any writing all of the idiosyncrasies of 30 million African Americans. This makes it difficult to access specific conditions because of their resemblance to stereotypical accusations, insistent that both sides of the story, the good and the bad, be told simultaneously, further complicates any effort to address problems which by virtue of importance have isolated priority. The need to explore all aspects of Black life is overwhelmingly welcome, unless the exploration points the finger at individuals guilty of creating the problems by how they behave. It is extremely important for the reader to understand clearly that the sole purpose of this study is to continue to examine the underlying causes of animosity between Black men and Black women. It is not an attempt to insult or publicly ridicule the Black man, nor should it be dismissed as superficial or typical male bashing. Recent experience has proven that confronting brutal truths about personal motivation is painfully embarrassing and usually met with gross denial. Many of the segments in this book contain information that appears to rival or contradict data presented in the Black Man's Guide to Understanding the Black Woman. This is done intentionally to reveal concurrent opposing behaviors between Black men and Black women, which ironically accelerate the demise of an already fragile union. Regrettably, a recent University of Chicago study concluded by the year 2000 70% of Black men will be unemployed, on drugs, in jail, or dead. The predictions are grim and seem self-fulfilling. The background reasons for this sad reality, all provable, are the blood-curling events of slavery, lack of opportunity, poor education, drugs, bad breaks, and setbacks. These obstacles are 100% the responsibility of the perpetrator who created and fostered special systems of human dejection. This misery is referred to in the African American experience as racism or outside intervention, a root cause of the resultant dis discontent inside this tattered community is the disorganization of the shattered black family. The secondary aspect of the problem, according to frustrated members of the group, is the failure of Black men to accept and deliver on their obligations as husband, provider, and father. Decidedly, the Black woman has failed miserably on the home front. Many months have been spent aggressively attempting to apprise Black women about how this failure manifests. Predictably, this deduction was not accepted happily. Pedestals toppled and were replaced with sobering realities. Complicated unpleasantries were acknowledged to pave way for progress. On the flip side of this dreadful predicament, the Black man must now study and recognize the mismanagement of his masculine authority. His blunders, as colossal and unintentional as his woman's, equally splinter the Black household. As head of the Black nation in America, whether he admits it or not, the Black man is solely responsible for any liabilities existing among Black women and Black children. Reportedly, the Black man has never taken proper charge of his own life, the life of his woman or his children. He has allowed himself to be overwhelmed by the strong wording of contemporary opinion and the unpopularity of addressing his own needs. All of the cries of racism have become a convenient crutch he leans on to explain his perpetual crippled leadership in and out of the house. 
While many of his negative habits are merely reactions to the ill-fated approaches of his woman and his mother, this has already been discussed in the Black Man's Guide to Understanding the Black Woman. This new study is devoted entirely to the greater problem, the irresponsible leadership of Black men and how they got to be the way they are. Although this book does not cover every aspect of African-American history, it does include factors contributing to the decline of the Black man's leadership potential. It also explains how Black male teens, unfamiliar with past and modern history, become displaced and reckless in the world. This book is merely a mirror, a galloping reflective account of this Black man, excuse me, of the Black man's last 19 decades in America. It chronicles condensed events and trends ordinarily unknown, which must be considered when dealing with him and making judgments about his condition. His mind was tampered with and brainwashing schemes must be discussed and understood. As before, I do not expect all black men to accept the accuracy of this report, but mass denial among them must not constitute cause to reject or disbelieve the contents of this work. Public confession is not necessary for improvement. Readers must realize that here is a man who claims he is victimized by entrenched racism, slanted justice, media attack, multiple drugs, and accessible we weapons, compounded with charges of genocidal conspiracy out to destroy him. Yet he has done little to ward off the results of such conclusions. He has been screaming foul for umpteen years, trying to bring attention to his unfair treatment. And he now dizzily wanders around crying racism at the slightest provocation, but still swears that the possibility of a diverse multicultural society exists. This book contains new perspectives. The suggestions made are not written to endorse or promote negative racism, Instead, they prove historically that the only successful multicultural society is the one where each race retains economic and spiritual individuality. Anything else creates confusion and resentment between nationalities and subsequently has landed the black man in his present predicament endangered and some say unhelpable due to his insistence in doing things his own way the wrong way for his survival. His pride is tissue paper thin, blowing in the wind. Hopefully, every black man will read this text and voluntarily place his nose to the grindstone of reconciliation with his manhood and proper evaluation of his political dreams. He must commit to save himself on any cost with minimal tears and moderate ego damage. False pride and stubbornness have no place when one is contending for self-preservation. And yes, the effects of slavery still rank as number one in the dismemberment of the black home and displacement of the black man. But the number two problem stems from contributory neglect of an internal nature that takes the form of A, disunity, B, distrust, and C, bad choices. Tragically, the number one problem cannot be reversed, but number two can be repaired. This is not shifting the burden, just smoothing it out a little to make it more manageable for correction. Black man, I have faith in you. Assalamu alaikum, Sister Shahrazad Ali. Chapter one, babyhood and puberty. Adult black men over the age of 40 have similar childhood backgrounds. They remember their past somewhat fondly at times and whatever complaints they recall are seemingly small unpleasantries when compared to the horror reports and wayward status of black male youth today. The majority of them were taught proper table manners, how to behave in public, respect for elders, the importance of attending church, neatness, household chores, control of his mouth, to be nice to girls, to fight only if aggress, the value of education, modest goals, moral convictions, obedience to parents, reasons to reject alcohol and tobacco, and why they shouldn't talk back. 
As a small boy, he played with ropes, Chinese checkers, puzzles, cards, dominoes, marbles, bikes, scooters, blocks, kites, wagons, electric trains, balls, trucks, guns, and cowboy hats. His make-believe heroes were Superman, G.I. Joe, the Lone Ranger and Tonto, the Cisco Kid, Batman, Zorro, Roy Rogers, and Davy Crockett and Daniel Boone. He learned of them from comic books, television, and radio programs. He was aptly entertained by Howdy Doody and Pinky Lee. He read Snow White, Little Red Riding Hood, Goldilocks and the Three Bears, The Three Pigs, and a host of nursery rhymes like Hickory Dickory Dock, Little Miss Muffet, Humpty Dumpty, London Bridges, and Jack and Jill. Television showed him moving pictures of Superman and he watched Father Knows Best, Ed Sullivan, Ted Mac Amateur Hour, Beat the Clock, The Price is Right, Queen for a Day, Alfred Hitchcock, Roy Rogers, and Dale Evans, Topper and Perry Mason. He heard other stories about Paul Bunyan and John Henry. Included in his visual were other shows all featuring brave, handsome, white male performers with glamorous female starlets, mostly with long yellow blonde flowing hair and sky blue eyes. He committed her features to memory and she was the first woman he drew a picture of in school. He loved to go to the movie theater to see gangster, western, and war flicks. Tarzan was Vanna and king of the jungle. Every action, every emotion, attitude, or moral judgment was demonstrated for him on the big screen in black and white or color cinematography with every situation featuring Caucasians conducting their business and social affairs. Lana Turner, Doris Davis, Dinah Shore, Marilyn Monroe, and Debbie Reynolds were just a few. few. Rock Hudson, Elvis Presley, Troy Donahue, and Clark Gable premiered as the top male actors. If the black man saw himself on TV, it was as the cook, the waiter, shoeshine boy, dishwasher, baggage carrier, car washer, maid or babysitter, always, but always in the employ of wealthy whites. If he wasn't sweeping the floor or running from ghosts, he was seen dancing a jig, grinning as wide as possible and stretching his eyes to the limit to show the most white or making other facial contortions designed to be funny and show him as ignorantly playing the fool. Some played in big bands and grinned along with the music but never spoke. He may have had the rare opportunity to see a raisin in the sun, imitation of life, Rochester on the Jack Benny show, Amos and Andy and the Kingfish, Carmen Jones or Green Pastures or Step and Fetch It with Shirley Temple. He did not seem to wonder why he wasn't featured in key roles in the movies or on TV. TV was fairly new during his childhood and he was basically understood that, and it was basically understood that white people were in charge of TV land. Then he was introduced to Uncle Remus and the Tar Baby, Buckwheat and Alfalfa, Little Black Sambo, Aunt Jemima on the Pancake Box, Uncle Ben's rice, and a host of other mammy products from syrup to shortening. He was aware of many outside influences that, that did not look like him, but his life had structure and his community was in agreement on certain behavior codes and in-home values. In the South, the differences between him and other races were more pronounced, and he was instructed and reminded with public signs that not only was he unalike, but had to move about in this world carefully. One of the main reasons he was taught to read was so that he did not accidentally go in the wrong door, drink from the wrong public water fountain, or get caught in certain areas after the sunset. His mother taught him to fear and be extra polite to whites as a way to protect himself. And she warned him of improper conduct, especially around white women and little white girls. He was taught to lower his eyes and never look them directly in the face, to remove his hat when addressed by them and never walk too close behind, beside, or in front of them, lest he be charged with being disrespectful. 
There was a penalty that went with disrespecting a white woman, so he must always keep his distance. He was warned that even an accidental glance could cost him his life. His parents and grandparents advised him to be friendly, smile, helpful, and do what he was told to do. Use good manners and be proud if whites recognized him or approved of his work. He was educated in a mode of behavior to save his life. He eventually heard stories about what whites did to blacks if they were in the wrong place at the wrong time. But he was not bored because blacks had their own sections of town and recreation outlets, which they could free, freely frequent and which they were sometimes visited by whites at will. But he was strictly forbidden from ever trying to patronize theirs. He learned to dance for whites. No matter where he lived, whenever it was time to have a party, they had fun. His father, if present, earned about $1,000 to $3,000 a year in income, although he usually never knew it. Provisions were made for him and he witnessed attempts to make sure he was not hungry. So other than owning a television set, there, had, there was little to compete with his family or their status in life. He was relatively comfortable in most cases and didn't realize for the most part if he was rich or poor since his black neighbors and friends all appeared to live the same way he did. Many of their guardians maintained single parent households. It was not that unusual at the time. If one of his friends lived with both his mother and father, he was revered as quite special. Many of their mothers had men friends who visited, stayed overnight, or lived with them periodically. He was taught to respect his mother's man and refer to him as Mr. So-and-so and to make few demands on his stand and father. And he often knew little, if anything, about his own biological daddy. It wasn't discussed much in his presence. And if the missing father showed up in town or in the neighborhood for a visit, it was considered a big deal and something to brag about. He was somewhat stifled regarding questions about his father. If he was told anything at all, it was some flamboyant reputation attached to his father, or he was given an overly negative historical account about how no good he was. He was routinely shipped, especially during summer, either to the north or down south to visit with relatives where the house rules were the same. And if he did something wrong, the whipping hurt just as bad. Often he witnessed his mother fighting with or being beaten up by one of her male friends. He got used to the stale smell of whiskey on Friday and Saturday nights. There was little he could do about it, but it made him dislike these unpredictable strange men who were too big for him to fight or defend his mother from. Many times this frustrated anger was directed and blamed on his AWOL father. He later learned to milk his mother's man for spending change or other minute benefits to forget what happened or to stay out of the way when he was visiting.